the extreme pleasure, uh, is that even a thing, extreme pleasure? I don't think so. Well, I have the pleasure to introduce Dominique Jackson and to moderate this conversation. But before I do, I just want to introduce Dominique and a little bit of her bio. So she's an actress, she's an author, she's a model. A lot of us may uh, know her from her lead role in Pose as Electra. She's been, I know, right? She's also on the weekly spinoff uh, series, American Horror Stories as Bloody Mary. She's also been a judge on the HBO series Legendary. I mean, she has done a ton. She's autobiography, the transsexuals from Tobago, model on the TV show Strut from Oxygen, a couple of other things, Dominique, that we're going to get into that I can't remember because I don't want to look at the board. But without further ado, Dominique, welcome to Talk at Google. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, Wow, sometimes you, I, the thing about me at times is I hear the introduction and I ask myself, who are they talking about? <laughs> I'm looking at it here and I'm like, wow, when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely. Well, Dominic, you know, said something about you, you know, your, your bio, but how would you describe Dominique Jackson? I am actually an, uh, how, how should I put it, introverted extrovert, uh, uh, introvert, extrovert, introverted extrovert. I don't know how I would put it. It's one of those two. But yeah, I'll switch it around <laughs> or something. But um, like I was just saying in the green room, I'm, I'm the girl that I'm out, I'm alive, I'm happy, I'm there in the moment. But then I need my solace, I need my quiet, I need to hear birds and trees instead of ambulances and sirens. I, um, so that's why we moved upstate. So <laughs> Dominique, I would say, is a determined woman who knew exactly uh, who she is but didn't know how to get there. But through faith and through, again, hope, determination, and just open-mindedness, I was able to um, get through a lot of uh, turmoil, which turned out to be some hard lessons in life, but definitely worth it, uh, to become a woman who just likes her peace. Like, I have gotten to a place where I don't even want to argue with anyone because I find it unnecessary. There's Google, you can find the statistics. We don't have to argue about sports. Um, anything that you are trying to find, I think sometimes we, we have gotten so accustomed to debating and arguing and this uh, justification of the fight that we don't see the peace and the serenity and the beauty of life. I loved when Eartha Kitt said, we create our problems. You know, she's like, life, we go after our problems. So for me, I'm just that cool chick that snowboards and loves to model, loves to act, loves TikTok and Instagram, and will go to Google before I argue. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I you know, I think beforehand we were saying there's like your day job and your sleigh job. And you're, like, <laughs> you're like, I have a sleigh profession. Yeah. So that's, that was really cool. That was really cool. <laughs> that, that was Rishi. Uh, if y'all want to know where that came from, like, give, him, give him credit for that. So, uh, Tommy, so we all have like a story. We all have a journey. You kind of like previewed a little bit of that. Uh, year starts in Tobago, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, can you talk to us? what that was like growing up there, you know, the pros, the negatives, the struggle that was a child so, there. Um, so at times it's all about, I, I feel like it's what we see. And when we see things, we get this lust. And it's a lust of I don't have instead of, oh, that's nice, I appreciate it, but I like what I have right here. And so Tobago for me was, is this beautiful place where the people can be bold, they can be friendly, they can be sweet. I used to travel around with my grandmother. She uh, was the elections officer for Tobago, a woman that had a position that 
you know, I didn't think women weren't supposed to have those positions. So it was just lined up. And actually, we're going to get to that part because it wasn't until I came to the United States that I realized that there were so many issues, but yet I was still so much safer. So anyway, Tobago is this place that's about, I would say, you can, when the plane lands, um, when you turn, like my fiance said, he said, oh my God, you really can see the ocean. <laughs> it's right there. Um, it's a short runway. You get off and you see people with smiles. You can already smell food. You smell the beaches. And for me, I was able to go into the countryside and see how people lived, not really like uh, archaically, but beautifully united in a sense where there may have been maybe two or three televisions in the village, in those particular villages, but it was still the bread oven outside, you know, the earth outside, to the pot, the hole for the, the pig, um, and beautiful homes, but still kept that traditional sense of where they came from. And when I went into Scarborough, which was about well, now that I went back as an adult, I realized it was only like 40 minutes away. Um, it's like you had like more of a city life with restaurants and stuff. So I was exposed to uh, diversity and to people not feeling less than because or social class in that sense. You know, it was more of, OK, we do this. We're happy with this. We do this. We're happy with this. But we don't look down on each other. And so that's what Tobago was for me until I turned um, about 11. And even before 11, uh, people would always say to me, you know, you're not a girl. And I would look at them like, no, you're confused. And um, because of that culture, they forced this uh, masculine uh, kind of, this masculine set of morals onto me, which I rejected quite quickly and easily, and uh, which brought a lot of like strain to them. But remember, when you're around like five, six, seven, eight, nine, you're you're really not, you know, thinking of these things. You have everything you want. You have the stuff, and then, you know, then came eleven, and I started to realize the difference uh, that um, puberty was setting in, and went to high school, the boys were, the education system is different. So I'm not saying that we're smarter or anything like that, but our system is just different. So at 10, I was in high school. Um, and the boys came back from the summer vacation, and they changed. And you know, so they didn't really smell that good. Um, and the ladies came back, and they were developing in a way that I realized related to me. So uh, breasts were growing. And that was a very confusing part of my life because there was no facial hair. There was no anything else. And I had been saying to these people for a very long time, I'm a girl. And they're like, uh, no. And uh, again, you're confused. <laughs> Not me. But uh, well, we'll just go with it. So uh, then um, I got to become an acolyte. And in becoming an acolyte that is serving on the altar with the priest, um, the Anglican uh, Church is of England, and it's almost the same as the Catholic Church. And uh, in that, the Tobago News, which is our local newspaper, carried a, a report saying that the priest was uh, homosexual and he was damaging to the community and all this kind of stuff. What they neglected to, re to, to say was, and this is what happens a lot, people confuse homosexuality with pedophilia. And they're definitely not the same thing. So um, this pedophile now had the power to stand on a pulpit and say to people, I don't do these things. A few weeks later, he got married. And then within a few months, uh, the wife was pregnant. And so it was like, oh, homosexual? No way, <laughs> right? No, nah, he's not. He's, those accusations are false. So people on the island, again, looking for that kind of, if your child is serving on the altar, then you have some kind of prestige, some kind of privilege. So they just sent all of us to, you know, who could go when. And that's when I saw 
the ugly side of my island, and that was that if, you know, it's not happening, and then the victims are being blamed. And so I refused. I refused to be a part of that. My experience with him showed me that, at many times, adults, to protect themselves, to, 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 to project an image, they will harm others and think nothing of it. So as a child, I'm looking at these adults who are saying and doing things to protect this man because of the image that he presented, because he's supposed to be your connection to God, right? So I realized I had to eliminate all that. I had to leave because at that time also, there was another person, there was a person on the island who was much older than I was who and we didn't have name, words for these things yet. They, they, we, there was no space for any of it. But this person, through all the rejection, they could not travel in a car or taxi or anything. So they had to walk wherever they had to go on the island. And for me, that was disastrous because I didn't know that people just like, you know, walked on purpose. Um, <laughs> And so for me, you know, you train for a marathon, but to get up and say, okay, I'm gonna walk from Charlottesville to Scarborough, which is gonna be like a, a day's walk, you know, that, I'm not doing that. But this person had to, they could not, they weren't afforded the ability to live with anyone, stay in anyone's home or anything. And even though we weren't a violent people on the island at that time, there was still like the throwing stuff at them, you know, the name calling. And what I gathered through all that was through all of this, this person should be ashamed of themselves, change themselves, do something. They carried on. The bed sheets were made into dresses. People lost their curtains. Next thing you know, they were here. And I was like, wait, I did this when I was like six or seven. So now, I don't have space on this beautiful island that, uh, that I love. And if I do, you know, live my truth, um, I'm going to have to walk. I'm going to have to sleep on the beach. And to some of you, that's like, yes, bring it on. <laughs> Not when you have to do it on purpose. Not when you have to do it because you are trying to survive. And so I left the island um, against my grandmother's wishes. Um, caused a lot of turmoil, but in hindsight, it was the best decision that I ever made for myself. Even though when I got to the U.S., um, for a few years it was great. I came from the islands. I was like 15 years old. I was shot straight into 11th grade. Everyone thought I was smart. I was doing everyone's homework. I was. It was. Lo it was lovely. So your school system was smarter than the U.S. Well, I, yeah. yeah uh, I just make sure. You know. So it was great. So now I had this space to fit in and forget. You know. Well, not forget because we don't. We just put it to the side because they always creep back up. And um, I had attention and stuff and I saw other people that were like myself now mind you when I was in Tobago I was looking at Vogue on BET with Donnie Simpson those eyes Donnie Simpson I love you baby and um, <laughs> and and BET and I saw Madonna's Vogue and I saw my uh, who would become my future father Hector Extravaganza and I'm looking at the screen and I'm like okay they're close to what I may be, but I don't know about this gay stuff, but they have freedom, so let me do that. And then I got here, and it was, oh, don't even worry about that. You know, focus on school. You have your schooling back, and you're like, you know, you're doing great. And then the body situation started again, the discomfort with the body and now I started to again want to find space with people that would you know understand and so I sought this uh, Lambda place in downtown Baltimore and I would tell my mother I had to work and I, would, I used to work extra hours run track and like high school was like great for me I had so much like exposure to everything except understanding me and so um, I went to groups, I went to that Lambda group, and the Lambda group um, was great for a little, it gave relief, but 
it wasn't, there was, oh, I can't say it, there was no satisfaction. Y'all might take that in the wrong way. Um, there, was, there was no me, right? There was, there was nothing for me except the fact that this possibility of, okay, these people are living freely and they're cool with you. So I went searching and of course I was searching for the sexual side of my identification because if I could relate sexually then maybe that's where I would at the time find myself. I didn't realize I needed to understand me before I could even engage with anyone sexually because that turned out to be very unfulfilling. And um, that's when I met the ballroom community. Whew, so we, we that's like five questions. Um. I know, <laughs> I know, I was helping you out girl, I was helping you out. Like, <laughs> so, so you so you came to the United States, right? So rough, you had the rough time in Tobago. Um, obviously, you saw someone of immense strength there surviving, and you said, "They're surviving. I want to survive, but not like that." Yeah, exactly. You know, and so then you've come to the United States after that, uh, and you're exposed to something totally different, right? You're now exposed to. Uh, what would be the queer community? Um, no, not when I first got here. Not, not when you first got here. When I first got here, I was exposed to black culture. Okay. In a different sense. And so that was like, you know, the real strength of black African American women who embodied themselves. Like men who there was a total different lingo. Like in Tobago, I had to always speak properly. And when I got here and started going to high school, and you know, my, you know, my friends would come to me and be like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, what's up? And I got, and they, and they cursed at the teachers. Now that was culture shock, like, what? What do you mean you can, look, some of you in here are going, what do you mean you can't curse at the teacher? They're, teacher, like, what? No. And in the Caribbean, there was also corporal punishment. Like, Define corporal punishment for people who don't know corporal like, punishment. Like, you get beat. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would, like, and this is how, when I got here, this is how I knew I was a fantastic kid. Because <laughs> even on that island, I didn't get punished, right? But I came here and I saw how, you know, my fellow brothers and sisters of the, the, the skin persuasion were acting and I was like, oh, I can't do that in my mother's house. <laughs> oh no, oh no, I, how am I, oh, and then you got sent to detention? Like, you just go sit someplace? They don't send you outside to pick your own switch or they didn't bring an old belt from at home? Like, no, this is what happens in the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, if they tell you, right, that you're wrong, you're wrong. There's no evidence, what evidence? You're under 18, and oh no, it's not 18, it's 21, right? So when I got here, there was also, it was like, it was so mixed, it was like bittersweet, because it was like, oh no, he's, he's Turks cursing at the teacher, and then she, she, it's gonna be a war in here, she's gonna grab him by the neck, and she's gonna beat him, and then his mother's gonna come in, and she's gonna beat him too. You know, the double punishment, that's the islands. Um, again, I didn't go through that. And this teacher said to him, go to detention, go to the principal's office. God, I'm safe for real. <laughs> then um, it was just the learning system was so was so different. Also, like kids got passed, and it wasn't just one test that determined your entire life. It was you know a series of tests, and the work that you did during the school year went towards your grade. So if you passed that last, if you didn't pass that last exam. Um, you could still pass the, the, the course. And then there was no, you're in first place and last place because again, in the West Indies, that's what they did. You know, the first in the class, the, the grading system, very different. And an A was like 95 to 100, a B was like 90 to 95. And if you got a C, you were dumb, you were stupid, and you, you were probably gonna get beat. <laughs> so, from the teachers and when you got home. Yeah, it was it, it was it was bittersweet, but it was great.
to be here because then there were parties. Like 16-year-olds were going to parties and stuff and hanging you out. out. What, what school is she go to? Like, uh, I went to Owens Mills High. And, no, but seriously, like, at 16 years old, like, kids were going out and staying out and having sleepovers and stuff like that. You know, like, actually going to, like, no, there was a skate it. rink that had, like, 16 and up, and I was just, like, totally fascinated. And my mother was like, no, you're going to church. And I'm like, well, that might be a problem. But um, I, I mixed them both. I was able to. So being in the U.S., the, the culture shock gave me freedom. It was, it was black culture from a different perspective. It was black culture minus the, 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 colon, the colonial type of forced language and understanding, and yet we still go back to it to be universal. But anyway. Uh, so um, think, I think we could have a whole conversation about that. <laughs> so we need to invite you back. Uh, so, but there's a point here, and you kind of started to allude to it here in a second, right? Where you said you were, uh, and I'm going to steal something you told us to forget about, but you said um, you were not satisfied, but in, because it probably was not, it was cool, Lambda, the group that you, but it was not, it still wasn't like cool, like, like how you saw yourself. There, there, I feel that, and I can only speak for myself, but I hope that each and every one of you can feel it too. There is something I feel inside of us that tells us who we are, and then we fight against that, right? And sometimes you have to fight against it, because, yeah, if it's telling you to hurt someone, then that's where your self-control comes in. But when it comes to your autonomy, when it comes to your existence, when it comes to not harming anyone else, you can't cage yourself in. So even though I found the group that was gay and lesbian, I still knew within that there was so much more. That wasn't just, that wasn't just it for my journey. So it's not Lambda, where is it? So it was standing on the side of the street on St. Paul Street in Baltimore, Maryland, and finally finding someone that was willing to give this 18-year-old some. And uh, you know what? And um, yeah. Let's be honest. We can't hide stuff. We want to be honest. Let's be brutally truthful. And as I was waiting there, you know, and he was giving me the whole nine, and I'm just innocent. This is the, I'm like, okay, I know. There come these people, and they're coming up the block, and they're loud. But the loudness was joyful. It was not violent. It was not... You know, to some people, that may be themselves, it might have been offensive because, yeah, you're paying a certain amount of money and you're hearing these people in the street and you want to sleep, but sorry. Um, they were joyful. They were not dressed in Dolce & Gabbana or anything like that. Actually, Shatira had on like a torn T-shirt. Her hair wasn't done. Uh, Tiffany had on bell-bottom jeans. And, you know, and they were just laughing and kikiing and just like... And they walked up to us, and Tiffany grabbed my hand, and she said, hi. And then they started, oh, you're beautiful. Oh, my gosh, you're going to walk face. Yes, ooh, and your body is just like thing. And I'm like, oh, my God, in all my 18 years, these are compliments. This is what they feel like. This is what, and there's this rush, and there's this, like, and I'm starting to feel this, like, joy. And I can relive this moment every time I tell the story because none of them are here anymore. And I didn't realize how important it was to me until they started, I started to lose them one by one. And that night, Tiffany grabbed my hand and she said, you're not dating him. And I looked at her like, I don't even know you. And you trying to block right now? You know there's a rooster in front of that. And, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm like, no. And, and, but I get sidetracked by, the affirmations, right. the you're somebody, you have value, 
with un in undertoned by your beautiful. You can walk face. You can be this. You can, be, and it's like, and you're gonna join our house. And I'm like, you just met me in five seconds and you are inviting me to your home and everything. And like no kind of serial killer stuff went through my head. It was just the pure joy that they brought and I left with them. And that was the first time that I found that love and that joy. I didn't have to defend anything or ask any questions. Mind you, I didn't even know about trans or anything. I just knew that I found happiness in that sense. And two weeks later, the young man that um, I was going to engage uh, passed away. He had been in the hospital for about a week. And Tiffany said to me, listen, it's this thing out here where people get infected. And they don't know how they got infected. Or people did it to them on purpose. And so they give it back. Once I started working at the, uh, at the Bronx Community Pride Center, that's when I started to see youth come in talking about gift giving and wanting to be infected so that they can get housing and health care and stuff like that. So flash forward, that part of my life taught me so much in that moment where they saved me. Because that young man, he was already in pain, right? And his way of, of dealing with it was to say, they did it to me, I'm going to do it to them. And Shatira and Tiffany and they that night saved me and took me into their home. And that is where, when my mother told me that I could no longer stay there through her pain, uh, I was able to go to Shatira's and Tiffany's and Miss Marty. And the beautiful thing about it was they had a grandmother, well, Shatira had a grandmother who knew that Shatira was different and, of course, trans, and she did not abandon her. Instead, she provided a space for us all to be. Now, she said she would come in. OK, I'll just say this. We'll just call her Miss Wu. Miss Wu would come in, and she would bang on the door. And when she banged on the door, she would start with, it's so dirty up in here, and the thing. And she would just go through this whole, like, it's like almost like watching The Color Purple. And she would just go through this whole rant and then come to, OK, at least y'all are here. Y'all safe. I love y'all. And she paid the rent. She read us for filth <laughs> all the time. But she paid the rent, and she dropped off groceries. And when it got too much on St. Paul Street, she moved us out. At times, we used to be fearful because she would come over, and Shatira would tell us to hide. So we would be in closets under thing, and she let us do that for a very long time until we got out to Frederick Avenue. And she was like, y'all MFs don't have to be hiding anymore. I know y'all have been living here for almost months now. And so that was that safe space that, and through that, through that grandmother, Shatira was able to provide that safe space. That was my first mother that came in and took that space. And Tiffany, my first sister, who really embraced me and said, I will protect you. I will care for you. And that led me down a path to not, to not want to just live to die. It made me want to live and enjoy life. It made me want to, I didn't, I, I no longer, even though there were a lot of struggles, even though I didn't have apartments. That love that they provided to me, that love that continued throughout the different parents that I had in ballroom, still helped me to survive to the point that I didn't really realize I was homeless until I got my first apartment. And that was years later. Because there were couches, there were places. And as a girl, they looked out for us. So if one, if, if a bunch of guys got butch queens, as we would call them, you know our lingo, got an apartment together, they would, you know, have the girls stay. And a lot of them got apartments because of uh, being infected. For trans women in New York, uh, there was HASA and free surgeries and, stop, and stuff would stop. So trans women would take in uh, butch queens and become mothers and kids and all that stuff because they had that 
space, that, that, that space was available to them where we could all be ourselves in that apartment and or where, wherever we were that we were able to sleep and um, yeah. So, <laughs> no, so I mean, you're hitting so many different aspects right now. So, um, you know, you're starting to talk about the chosen family, like yes. in, in the ball scene culture and obviously extremely important. You know, so many times uh, we've heard like the ball scene uh, has saved lives and so forth. it for sure saved your life. Like you gave this example of um, someone was going to give you a gift that you did not want. No, that was really going to be a, um, no, you shouldn't have. Right, exactly. And so um, now you're, you're there, you're, you're being affirmed, you, you know, by this, uh, by your family, your chosen family. Um, for so many people in the ball scene, a lot of them, they end up leaving the ball scene at one point, right? That sometimes it's no longer fulfilling or, an, they want they go to another thing to find some other type of love. Did you have this experience? No, um, actually, for me, ballroom is still a very active. Art. Yeah, it's up. It's me. You know, when like I know on Legendary, I said I am ballroom, and in that moment, you know, I even shocked myself because I was just so. How could you be so bold? But then I thought about everything. And it's because for me, ballroom has all, so Michael Roberson is one of my chosen and proven brothers, right? And Michael Roberson came to me and he said, I'm your butch queen. Oh, sorry, excuse me. So what that means is that all the girls, we do have a butch queen, which sometimes we call them our butch queen husbands, our butch queen whatever, because you know, in all reality, for some of us, we just need that safety, that protection, whatever. And some of the cis men are just stupid. So um, some, some. Yeah, so um, Michael became that brother to me that when I was going through uh, needing the money for my green card, right? and. So let me just push this in here because I know you're gonna um, feed on this in a little bit. And my uh, husband at the time was being a cis man from a certain place that we just not gonna name, but you know. Um, I was like, I needed help. He was making money and knew that getting this green card would give me a freedom because everything for me had to shut down once I realized that this green card is so important. After 9-11, there was no like working off the, could you imagine the torture I had to go through? Like, I was trying to do three shows a night because sex work just wasn't working for me. I was bad at it. I'm not even gonna lie to you, I was bad at it. I mean like really bad. <laughs> Um, I made money, but you know, there were very few repeats. <laughs> no, I, I, listen, I was so bad, I couldn't even rob the dates. <laughs> like, I, it was so bad that at one point, and I remember this one because I beat myself up for it for a very long time. I was in that predicament of my husband not willing to help me with that said green card. And so, Sometimes you gotta do something strange for some change. This is survival. This is where we come from. This is what we were taught by our elders. So I had to go back into this world that I had almost escaped. I had become a showgirl. I had become, you know, working in the organizations, working in nonprofit, and now I was shut down. I couldn't do anything, so I had to go back. And what happened in that moment was this man had like thousands on him. But he told me that he had a birthday party the next day for his daughter and that he had to get through the tunnel to Jersey and stuff like that. So when I saw all, and we had a negotiated, I hate that part, negotiated price, and then he was drunk and like, and those are the dates that you really like. I'm just not, I'm gonna be honest with you, right? And if you bad at a drunk date, then you really bad. <laughs> but those are the dates that I like, and no, to be on a serious note, 
those that were on drugs, those that were like getting, so this guy was just like almost totally done. And when you date someone that's inebriated, they can't really function, so you're safe. So um, in a way, um, so I went to, I said, okay, great, I'm gonna take this money, I could pay for my green card. And he had thousands. And I thought about what he had to do for his daughter and then I thought about him having to get back home because he shouldn't have to drive. He's going to have to take a cab home and then cab back. And I only took what we negotiated. <laughs> and when I got home, I was so mad at myself. I was so done with it. <laughs> I was just so over it. Oh. I mean, this is both like sad, thrilling, sad, mad. Like, there's a whole bunch of feelings I have with this yeah. story right now. Um, so you're done. So just so y'all know, if you, let me catch up. All right. So like, you were in the trade, right? You were oh, working. Yeah. You were working. You eventually, as so many, so many, we see so many crawl out. Eventually, have your own job, trying to do doing not for profit because that's the that's where they want to. Yeah. See, that's the. One. That's where we found space. That's where we can right. But they don't want us to run the not for profit. We're not going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, but um, so but then. Your actual partner at the time didn't want to pay for your green card because that would give you some freedoms. Yeah, well, I sent this dude to school and everything too while not having a green card and, you know, doing what I had to do because I looked at it as, okay, see, my grandmother didn't want to get married, so she took care of everything herself and had two daughters. So therefore, for me, it was like, okay, I came from a space of grow with the man, so even if you... I, we didn't look at it as breadwinner or anything like that. It wasn't putting someone down. We never put my father down. I don't know why. Um, and, you know, it was more of a you grow, you grow together. So when I helped him get to where he needed to be, the world told him and his friends that I shouldn't be. But he forgot how he got there. So when the tables were reversed and now I needed help, it was my identification that was used to justify not helping me. Those days that he laid at home and couldn't work and I, I went out and I did the shows, I got on poles and danced and all that stuff, they were not reciprocated. They were not appreciated. Instead, they were used as weapons against me. And so in that, I had to um, do it for myself, so I had to go right back into it. And once I got back into it, it was even more pressure on myself. But I knew that I had to survive. And I was not going to come this far and wait 20 something years for a green card and then let some crazy thing cause me to, to cease it. But I was in it. It was horrible. I was devastated. And then here pops my butch queen brother, Michael Robeson, who says to me, no, you're going to go speak. I was like, what? He was like, no, you're going to go speak. I'm booking you. You're going to, to a conference in Dallas. You're going to go to BHAP, and you're going to speak. You're going to talk about your story. You're going to talk about your existence. You're an intelligent woman. I know how you are on the stages. You can do whatever you want to be do. Because then there was the other part where I almost got deported going to Puerto Rico because I was really, really desperate for work. So when the club I was working at was going to Puerto Rico, and I wanted a vacation too. So I was like, it's Puerto Rico. They belong to the US. And I went over there and then they almost <laughs> deported me. And that was a disaster just going through the airport. But in the back of that golf cart, and it was Memorial Day. So all the ballroom kids, some of the ballroom kids were there too. My, oh God. Yeah, and then I got there and I realized that in all that drama and all that what I thought was embarrassment, that was the way I found out that I actually got an approval from the United States and I was on my way to getting that green card. So bam, I got back on that flight the next day. I came back to New York and then following that, Michael calls me, so for, that was in 2007. And for the next five years, I refused to leave the house, get on a plane. If it wasn't about money, whether it was $50 or something, and they were still doing little shows. I did not do the sex work until like uh, 2015 for, for like three months, I think. Anyway, yeah, so um, we, where was I? It's a lot. See no, what I mean? A That's lot. why I have to get It's myself. a lot. 
And, and just for everybody, we will, if you want to ask questions, I have about two more. There's a ton, so I could keep asking questions. But if y'all, I do want y'all to ask questions too. Once you start lining up, I'll start transitioning over to the questions y'all have. Yeah, and as long as y'all not getting bored, because I don't do bored. Hey, you said you wanted to see me. Get off that phone. Who are you texting? Who are you, who are you calling right now? Okay, no, I'm just messing around. <laughs> no, so, um, so where, where do you, if you feel like um, you're in a space, and if you're not, that's totally, to, it's uh -huh. okay to be honest on that fact too. Where do you feel like you went from surviving to thriving? Right, because you are so many things. Uh, I would say you're an icon, right? And so, like, she is, right? I'm not, I'm not well, a place, I ain't a place. You are. Thank you, but I think we are both iconic because look at what you have done, right? From uh, the army, I, th I think, right? Right. Right, to representing us, to showing up and showing the world that we can be anything and we are everywhere and we thrive. So for me, thriving came when I realized that, honestly, the world wasn't holding me back. I was, because I was believing the world's view of me. So I realized that I had to get out there, and every rejection meant that it was things. So thriving for me came from my actualization, my realization that this is me, right? And the homelessness, the heartache, the pain, all that stuff. The, that chaos exists outside of me, right? I can't step into the chaos, even though it seems like it's, it should be a part of me, even though it's about me, right? I had to learn to step away from that chaos and focus on me. And it's in stepping out of the chaos, out of the name calling, out of the family issues, out of the feeling bad for myself, right? Out of feeling like because I'm a black girl, if I go to therapy, they're going to think I'm crazy. No, if you don't go to therapy, that's when you're crazy. And I got into therapy. And it helped me with everything. So I, I would say I started, to, I started thriving when I started to see myself the way I wanted other people to see me. And in seeing myself the way I wanted other people to see me, it led me to really, really not care, unless, unless I do bad fashion. If I do bad fashion, you know, <laughs> you could say something, all right? But other than that, you know, it's like I am me. And I thrive because I believe that who I am is not an abomination, that who I am is beautiful, that who I am is successful, and then bam, there was Strut, there was the book, there was Pose, and oh yeah, Michael got me to go to BHAP and do that conference, and once I did that, I came back, I saw trans women who were thriving that were from ballroom. Ay Ayana Maim, who is absolutely amazing. I think I saw you with her one time, so I yeah. And, um, and uh, Jasmine Perez and Valerie Spencer and all these women who were doctorates and uh, had doctorates and, and degrees. And I'm like, wait a second. And you did what? And you were where? And then I have a sister who was incarcerated for 14 years a chosen and proven sister. And then she comes out and she is the most loving and caring. And I say that, I say, you know what? This is, this is life. You thrive when you, when you understand you and you understand that you are not competing with anyone but yourself. Um, well, I have one more question, y'all. So if someone wants to, to start to line up, uh, I'll get to you after this question. Um, so, you know, so many times, and, and we hit on this before, uh, and, and I love at the end of your autobiography where you list so many names, but the question is around giving back, right? And so many times we don't think about who we're giving back for, right? So how do you think about giving back knowing that there's so many people that gave to you who are no longer here. So how do you recognize them in that? So I don't look at it as giving back because when you, I feel like in giving back, it feels like you, you took something and left. 
I never left. And what was given was absorbed. The good, the bad, and then there was the, the figuring it out, right? Is this going to be good for me? It may have been good for this person, but is it going to be good for me, right? This was good for that person. Is it going to be good for me? Figuring all of that out and then realizing that the same thing that you want for yourself, not the actuality of it, not the being a doctor, not the being an actor, but the part of being successful, of being able to thrive, of being able to walk out your door and know that people may say stuff, but that that bubble that you have formed where you yourself, and I'm going to put it to you like this, where you yourself are worshipped inside of it, but not to the point of conceit. So some of you take it there. <laughs> right. In that space where it gives you that confidence to know that they're talking from a space of their own issues, then you know that anything you do with your community, you stand with your community. You don't now assume that space of, OK, I have made it out. Cha. How y'all doing over there? <laughs> All right, yes, well, you know I'm from there, but <laughs> I don't go back there, right? I never left. And so for me, being director, uh, being on the board of directors for Destination Tomorrow, an organization that is founded and led by a trans man who has had experience and education and who comes from ballroom, right? Giving back to me is, and it, this wasn't giving back, this was actually an honor for me, for HMI to ask me to be their ambassador, right? Hetrick Martin Institute, for any of you who don't know what that is, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Audrey. And give Audrey a huge round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We still have questions. Thank you so much, Tom. So, thank you. No, no question. If I may, so hi, my name is Nuno. Welcome to Google. Thank <laughs> you, a Pleasure to have you here. There's, there's so many thoughts going in my head, but I want to start with gratitude. Uh, for you, for sharing your wisdom. Uh, you mentioned community, you mentioned chosen family. I know you don't like the term giving back, it's an honor, <laughs> but I would love for you to expand a little bit more about all of those intersections, giving back to your, I know you don't like the term, but. <laughs> but showing up for my community. Yes, showing That supported me for so long. Like for instance, you know, e even a simple little post, right, that, I see one of my sisters doing great, like Mila Jam, you know, musician, artist, doing great. Laverne Cox, like these are the things. Um, um, India Moore, Angelica Ross, Haley, of course, my cast members, of course. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I like but then I get to look at Kim Petras, right? And I share this stuff. I share on my Instagram a lot of the uh, other. And how should I, when I say other, I mean like they're not American. So if I see like Imara, well, Imara Jones is American, but phenomenal journalist, right? But a lot of people don't know. So because you're coming to me because Electra reads everyone or whatever, right? I get to use my platform to be able to promote and show the love and show the diversity and the uniqueness, the professionalism, the talent of my community. And it goes far beyond. It's just, I mean, we are a talented people. I believe that's why they always try to hold us back. Nice. Thank you for saying that. Is yeah, this room? I told my manager I was going to faint if I get to ask you a question. <laughs> um, I'm a huge fan. And uh, I actually was introduced to Pose through my mother, um, who's 85, will be 85 in July. And um, it was just a transformative experience for me. So I have a question. How can we be advocates for the trans community? Like, wh what would you recommend us as heterosexual, bisexual, gay men and women? How can we best be your advocate? OK, so much love to you, sweetheart. <laughs> um, yeah, so I get asked that question, right? And to me, it's like a, really a no-brainer, you know? And, and please, I want you to take this with the 
the, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to advocate, right? Those are the terms. And these words that we keep making up and making up and making up and trying to decide which one is working for which one and which one is this one, these are human beings, right? We're all human beings. That's it. When we go to the doctor, right, our doctor is the one that has to tell us what's going on with us and what's right and what's not wrong and what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. Not some person who has never been in your body or anything before that. We should not be sitting around telling other people how they should be. So to be an ally, to be, and again, they use all these words, but I just want to say to be respectful in spaces where people may be derogatory, you can speak up, right? When you have those thoughts, check them out. Visit uh, an organization. Get, if you have doubts or you are feeling like a trans person is something weird to you, right? Visit an organization. Find out about it. Do some, you can Google, <laughs> like, you do not have to come up to me. No, I'm not talking about you. You're good. You're good, right? <laughs> you, no, no, you just took me someplace because it's like people come up to me and they're like, well, trans, I don't know about that. And I'm like, you have a computer? <laughs> do you have internet? They're like, oh, well, maybe. So no, right? It's a, we are human beings. And I think that we have all forgotten that. We have taken race, we have taken social status and class and skin color and all this kind of stuff and used it as barriers for us to say to each other, you are not my brother, you are not my sister, you are not my sibling. Mm. Why Break those down. I look at it and the most phenomenal thing for me was when one of the people that took me out of sex work, because he said to me, if you want to do sex work, you can choose to, but I'm going to show you a different life, took me to his family, Stephen Arlene Sukov. I send them my love forever because those people also saved my life. And they white and Jewish, right? And it was about, they didn't, it wasn't about me being trans or anything. It was about, they saw a beautiful young woman who needed help. And they wanted to help. That was, that was it. That was it. I was not threatening to them. I was very appreciative. I was grateful for the fact that someone saw value in me and wanted me to wear skirts that came to the knee instead of above my butt. And um, yeah, and that means a lot. You know, like, because what did I have? They taught me that I had autonomy over my body. And that if I chose to dress a certain way, that was for me, not because I had to in order to survive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your um, Again, thank you so much. Um, just before you coming on, you're talking a little bit about a story where you traveled back. And it actually gave me hope. So I was hoping if you'd be willing to share to the broader community. Oh, when you're, you're speaking of uh, my trip to Tobago, well, oh my gosh, it's, it's been twice now. Um, so in October, uh, my grandmother turned 95, and uh, my, we wanted to take her back to Tobago for her to celebrate her birthday day with family and stuff. And I was like, OK, I'll help you pay for it, but I ain't going. Because you know what? The world has changed, and I know these people hate me, they blah, blah. I was ready to read my uncles and everything, because some of them you know, were a bit thing. And I was like, yeah, I'm going back. I'm confident. I have everything that's for me. So no one can tell me, look at me. Not even that I'm a star, but look at me. I am successful. Because that star and that fame don't bring you anything. Child, you got to work. <laughs> so um, I go back to Tobago, and I'm greeted with love. Lots of love. And yeah, there are the naysayers, but what do I do? I focus on the, the goodness, the, the, the greatness of it. And after 32 years, I was able to go back to that beautiful place that I love and enjoy it so much. My fiance went with me, and he, that's my Kevin Costner. And he used to, no, seriously, he, he was my, he was, well, is my it's bodyguard. It's her bodyguard. It's is like her my bodyguard. bodyguard. He just never got on the plane. And yeah, so Tobago <laughs> was really like just this beautiful experience. And when I got back there, I realized that I put all this stuff in my head, and I was ready to, to just, you know, I was ready for the fight because, yeah, I'm going home for my grandmother. I don't care what you say, right? 
And besides, I'm paying for it. Um, <laughs> and it was great. And cousins and people asking each other, you know, uh, well, what do we say? You know, what, what, what do we call them? And I'm like, see, this non-binary thing should be easy because when you mad at us, we they and them. And, um, and that's a West Indian thing. And, and so it was, it just set into me. And so we went back a second time because we had to go back for my grandmother again. She wanted to handle some business and she wouldn't let me come without uh, my fiance who she loves so very much. So I, I just say this, that, that people, it's not that they change. I think it's that we improve, right? And once we improve, we get to an open-mindedness that allows us to know that we are so strong in ourselves, that we exude that confidence and strength that people that are naysayers can't attack you. So they try to draw up legislation. Got one more. One more. I think we have one more. I forget. One more. Hi, so my name is KP. I just want to say thank you again for coming. Um, I was listening to your story and I couldn't help but hear the theme of, of eras of like how you've been through these periods of joy and of, of grief and of, of trying times. And I think that's also a popular phrase we hear nowadays. It's like, oh, I'm in my sad boy era. I'm in my, my hot girl era. Um, you <laughs> your mad what? Your hot boy era, your sad girl era. Like that's a uh, uh, why does it get to be hot boy or sad girl? Like why we can't flip that? <laughs> <laughs> but just hearing you talk about having to go back to work that you didn't want to do, or having these times where you were succeeding, can you talk a little bit more about you know to end on a high note what it means to practice that resilience and to look forward to your end goal in mind, even if it's like let's say a tough era or a period of time where you might not be your happiest? Because I think in you, we see a lot of strength, and I want to know how to practice that strength. Well, um, I will say thank you for that, first of all, and um, for, for the hot girl era. Um, <laughs> I, I will just say, again, it is within yourself, right? You have to find your strength within yourself. You have to be very confident within you. Now, say that last part of that question again, because your hot girl comment got me. Yeah, you were talking a lot about how you had to go back to you know, having to do sex again yeah. to, to get to where you are. And so having that end goal in mind, how do you practice right. that resilience? Got you. So it's a journey, right? You are embarking on a journey when you decide that you want to live the life that you want to live. And if that journey strays from what the societal normal norm is, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have to realize that any time you go against the grain, it's not going to be a bed of roses. And in 2006, I had the epiphany of waking up and realizing that I lived through a year that pastors and priests called me up and told me I was going to die. And I said to myself, wait a second. It's 2006. I lived. I'm waking up that morning, and I'm like, wait. It's in the past. It's done with. It didn't happen, right? So then I realized, too, that this is my life. And I direct it, I guide it, and everything that happens on that journey gets me to my end goal, right? To become an actor. I could not be the actor that I am today. I could not have played Electra if I was not molested, if I was not raped, if I didn't have to flee my country, if I didn't meet those ballroom people, if I didn't work in nonprofit, if I didn't lose two of my kids to HIV and then lost many more, if I didn't lose many of my friends to HIV, if I was not homeless and slept in Central Park, if, if Tiffany didn't grab my hand that day and say you're not sleeping with him. These are all parts of your journey because when you get that end goal, you have to tell the story. And if all those things didn't happen, we would just be sitting up here looking at each other with me being fabulous and having nothing to say. <laughs> so I will tell you this. If you're going after something, make sure that whatever you do to get there, you bring no harm to anyone else. But you understand that in that journey, there will be detours, there will be hills, there will even be people shooting fire, arrows, brimstone, and probably some AK-47s at you. And it's gonna feel like that, no pun intended or anything, because that's what it feels like, right? When you're in that space of feeling like you are done with, 
okay, where there's nothing, where you have spent your last dime, where you have done what they told you or whatever, right? And you're in that space of, okay, I'm done. I'm going to give up. That's when you go, and that's only if you feel it within your gut, if you know that's for you. That's when you go, I have to work harder. It's like the sit-ups. When it starts to burn, that's when you keep going. That's when you go harder. So every time, yeah, I went to auditions and stuff crying. I left those auditions crying. Some of you have probably seen me on the train and don't remember it, but I was that girl in the corner just crying at 3 a.m. in the morning because I couldn't go home to my husband and I couldn't go to the club. But I took all that and I said, I'm going to go to every audition that I can. I'm still gonna work because a person that's not working, that's not motivated, that's not moving is wallowing in trauma, wallowing in disdain, wallowing in the things that could be. It can't be if you don't get up and do something. Wow. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> icon, icon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, right. Arjun. Right. And people, just love yourselves. I mean, this sounds so crazy, but just like, if you're starting to have bad thoughts about someone, like, what? oh, hey, how you doing? Like, why is her dress like that? Or why did he wear that? Cut those thoughts off and think, why do I care? Why is it bothering me? Thank you, Daddy. Why is it bothering me? <laughs> you know? So I love you all. And love yourselves. And just look at each other from a perspective of we're all human beings. If you're trying to undress other people and talk about you know, their body parts and stuff like that, that's a whole different story. And it might cost you. So um, just be respectful of people. Thank you. Thank you for being here.